Hello, today we're going to be looking at the ship's log and specifically why you keep a ship's log and how to keep one filled in properly. Uh, so the, the primary reason for keeping a ship's log, uh, A, it's good practice, uh, B, if you're a commercial vessel, then if you're British registered, the merchant shipping safety of navigation regulations require compliance with Chapter 5 of the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, or SOLAS. So all UK vessels on international voyages, um, and that's other than pleasure vessels, as I say, must keep a log. Now that log doesn't have to be on paper. You can keep an electronic log, and you can even delete that electronic log or um, electronic um, track, for instance, on chart plotter after the... Um, end of your voyage as long as, the, as there were no incidents but if you do that you must retain a paper log so there is a need to keep a paper log in effect so why do we keep it as i say good practice but also you need to be able to track what has happened on board you need to be able to refer to it to aid you with navigation in the event that you should lose your position maybe lose your uh, navigational instruments and you ought to be able to reconstruct the voyage of the vessel, uh, both so that you can find where you are, and secondly, so that in the event of an incident, an investigating body can establish what happened and when. So there is a legal requirement there, and it is important that you keep the log accurately. Okay, so looking at an example of a log, this is a, an extremely good I think, uh, example of a, a thorough log for a sailing vessel. Uh, this was the log that I used on CV23 on the Clipper 2019-20 Round the World Yacht Race. So as you can see, first of all, there's um, some fairly rudimentary basic information, but all relevant. You've got a date, the total number of persons on board, the name of the skipper, and the name of the AQP. The AQP is effectively the first mate on board and the, the second in command, if you like. Uh, then uh, there's pre-departure checklist checkbox. So uh, the Clipper Race have an awful lot of um, standing orders and procedures in place to protect their staff and their crew. And... Um, it's important that all of that is kept up to date and complied with. So the pre-departure checklist tick box is there just to remind the skipper uh, to make sure that everything is in order. Uh, then if we go across the top of the log, you can see this is there's basically 24 boxes that run um, down the page. And of course, there's 24 hours in a day. So each page is for a 24 hour day. Along the top is the daily maintenance and routine checks. So again, they're primarily as an aid memoir and also so that whoever is responsible for undertaking those checks, when they're done, can go to the logbook and sign their initials to say, yeah, that's been done for the day. Uh, now, normally what happens on the Clipper race is that various members of crew are, are um, allocated various jobs on different days. So on the race itself, you'll normally have one or two people responsible for things like being bosun and engineer on board. And they will take overall responsibility for the maintenance of the vessel under the skipper and mate. And then every day there will be a variety of daily activities, which are normally the responsibility of a specific crew member who happens to be the engineer for the day, etc. Um, now, it's all pretty self-explanatory, really safety gear. So checking everything on deck, checking everything below deck, making sure everything is in place. Bilges, checking the bilges, making sure that there are no leaks. Uh, uh, or if there is water in the bilges that the water is cleared. Steering gear, so checking all the steering gear to make sure that it's in good order and doesn't need adjusting. Um, a deck walk, so a deck walk is exactly that. Looking at all of the um, guardrails, 
looking at the lifelines, uh, all the kit, all the uh, deck furniture, the rig, running and standing rigging, uh, everything you can see from the deck to make sure blocks are all in place, that um, bolts at the gooseneck are all in place, uh, nothing's coming loose, uh, nothing is worn or frayed. Uh, a rigging check, so the rig check aloft uh, is generally done whenever you've got the right conditions to do it um, and probably you probably do an aloft rig check every three or four days if the conditions are right because if the conditions are poor you're probably not going to be able to do it for a few days you'd certainly do it before very bad weather was coming in and you'd do it after bad weather had gone just to make sure that um, there wasn't a problem with the rig um, sales so that's a matter of um, just checking the sails that are being used at the time and making sure that uh, Hanks and um, uh, all the stitching on the sails is in place, UV covers are in place, etc. Engine check, same as on any other boat, check the engine and uh, do your daily engine check to make sure that, um, uh, that oil is topped up and coolant and uh, everything else is in place and the same with the generator. And those checks obviously have to be done when the generator is not being used not but not running or not hot um so there's a matter of planning when you do that but during the day um usually the generator is run when you are um cooking food because uh, a lot of the boats use electronic rice boilers and things like that or electric rice boilers so all of those things have to be done uh, and initial. Now, some of those things will be done more than once a day, but at least there you can see that everything will have been done at least daily. Then looking at the columns, you'll see we start at the left hand side of the column and um, on here you've got UTC. So uh, obviously universal time corrected. So effectively universal time for all intents and purposes. Um, so that is um, otherwise known as Greenwich Mean Time. So the time that goes in there, UTC, and the UTC is used a lot um, in navigation because it is a constant datum that you can refer to. And then you have local time. So local time, local time is usually um, a f better known really as boat time. So local time will be the time that the boat is running to. So your watches would usually run to local time. And if you're sailing east or west, then um, you need to allow for the fact that you are sailing through time zones and keep local time as close as possible to uh, the local time of the location on the planet where you are. If you don't do that, then over time you'll end up with your watches running so that you, you, you've got watch changes and breakfast being served at uh, nine o'clock at night. So every 15 degrees or so east or west, you would be looking at uh, changing local time. That's normally probably every three or four days, uh, depends on the speed you're doing, of course, and your course. So you've got universal time and local time. It's important to make sure that you don't just follow everybody else. If, if time has changed, if, you, if the boat time has been changed, you must make a note in the log and you must reflect that in the first entry after or at the time it's done. Otherwise, people have a habit of just copying what's above and of course it can be wrong. Uh, latitude and longitude, well latitude and longitude is copied down from the GPS and that is basically a position fix of that moment in time. Your compass course, that will come from the helm, so you would be asking for a compass course from the helm and that compass course um, is written down and then you've got true course and course over ground. So true course allows for conversion from compass to true. So to allow for that conversion, you need to know the deviation of the boat that you're on, on the course that you're on. And you also need to know local variation in the part of the world that you're sailing. So you'll find variation from the chart, from the compass rows on the chart, and you'll find deviation from the um, deviation card which will be in the navigation station. Uh, if you want to know more about how to convert
from Compass to True and from True to Compass, then uh, check out our video on Variation and Deviation. Uh, then Course Over Ground. So Course Over Ground is your actual GPS, effectively your GPS course, the course that your GPS is telling you, um, over the ground, not through the water, but over the ground. So what is the difference? Well, largely this is down to the effect of current, tide, and leeway. So any of those things will uh, uh, will change what is your true course to your course over ground. Um, so course over ground, again, that would come off the GPS. Uh, water speed in knots. So this obviously comes from a sensor, which is a small log wheel, which is is um is being turned by the water as the boat passes through the water and so um that's the water speed and then speed over ground so in the same way as with course speed over ground can be affected uh by tide current um and if you've got if you're on tide or you're on current then um your speed over ground will be higher than your water speed if you're going against tidal current, your water speed might be quite high, but your speed over ground will be lower. So um, the reality is speed over ground, but your water speed um, um, may be quite different to that, but you need to know the difference and why there's a difference between the two. Then you've got log. So the log, again, in this instance, comes from the GPS. And um, so this is a GPS log in nautical miles. So you would read that off the the trip on the log and you would write down uh, the last few digits, the last three or four digits of your uh, log there under log GPS. Uh, distance in nautical miles. So that column is the difference between the hour before's log reading and the log reading that you're currently looking at. So uh, the, that might be eight or ten or whatever, and that's in nautical miles. Power stroke sail, well, that's either a P or an S. That either means you're under power or you're sailing. Obviously, when you're racing, you're going to be sailing unless something has gone wrong. Uh, wind direction in degrees. So, um, again, fairly obvious. That is um, where the wind is coming from. So if it's blowing a northerly, they want it in degrees. So it would be 0, 0, 0 degrees. Uh, the westerly, then 270 degrees. Uh, true wind speed in knots. So the true wind speed and the apparent wind speed are different. And we go into that in another video. Uh, true wind speed is actually the, 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 the wind that's actually blowing on the Earth's surface. And apparent wind speed is apparent wind as you feel it. So uh, I'll go into that in more detail in another short video. So again, from the instruments, um, you've got um, true wind speed in knots and true wind angle. That's the angle of the true wind to the boat itself. Then we have apparent wind speed, as I mentioned before, and that's in knots too, and apparent wind angle, again, in degrees. And then a barometer reading. So this is very important, and together with all the other information that we're collecting here, will give a clear indication of what is actually happening with the weather and what's likely to happen in the future, especially when it is... Uh, looked at in conjunction with a detailed weather forecast. Um, right, okay, now uh, what else have we got? Sea state. So the sea state, um, that basically is whether it's uh, smooth, calm, moderate, rough, very rough, high, uh, or phenomenal. So uh, sea state is... Um, Again, there'll be a, another video on this, but sea state is a specific reference to the size of the waves. And um, uh, there is a sort of a key to that, so you need to know which word to use. Um, then on the next page, going across the columns to start, we've got cloud. So cloud cover. Now this is, um, the way we look at this, we look at it uh, on a scale out of eight. So if it's four out of eight, you've got a 50% cloud cover. If it's uh, three out of eight, then obviously three eighths cloud cover, etc. So your cloud cover, again, 
important when you're looking at cloud cover and when you're referring to weather forecasts and to um, um, things like wind shifts uh, it gives you an indication of what's actually happening to the weather in the local area so it's important that you don't just guess that just don't just glance out of the hatch you need to ha have a look at that before you go below uh, weather and visibility so yeah, is it raining uh, is it foggy fairly straightforward then we've got a larger comments area which is um you're restricted to one line of the log um, so you can't be too verb too a verbose here and um, so we've got evolutions observations notes remarks and overview of the last hour so it's only for that hour and it'll be anything that's happened in that hour so you might have put a reef in you might have taken a reef out you might have changed the head sail changed it from a yankee one to a yankee two um, anything that has happened in that hour you would, that's relevant you would put into that um, into that line that's telling a story about what's happened on the boat so um, for example one of the reasons that might be needed is that um, if there were an incident on board and then the log was looked at and there was no reference to the boat um, being properly managed and having reefs put in or um, um, having reefs taken out or whatever then if it's not in the log it can't be relied upon in any investigation so that's the reason that we have that information there it also means that the skipper if he's asleep can jump up and have a quick look at the log and see what the state of play is with sail plan etc okay and then sail plan so in a bit more detail now we've got uh, mainsail staysail yankee and asymmetric so those are the different types of sail and then uh, so mainsail either be a full mainsail or it might be one reef two reefs three reefs so that normally would be written R1 or R2 or R3 or full F. Uh, and then stay sail. So that's either a tick for yes or a cross for no. Or, or just don't make a note in the box. Different skippers will have a different way of looking at it. But um, uh, we just need to know whether the stay sail is, being, is set and being used or not. Yankee. So we've got um, effectively four different Yankees. We've got Yankee 1, Yankee 2, Yankee 3, and then we've got the Storm storm Jib, which can be used as a Storm Staysail um, or as a Storm Jib. So that would effectively be referred to as Yankee 4, perhaps, or as S for Storm. And then Asymmetric. So which Asymmetric? Is it, uh, is it um, uh, C1, C2, or C3? So um, depend on which of the spinnakers you're using you would uh, mark that down with the appropriate number battery voltage so that would be your main domestic battery bank and that's the voltage of your main domestic battery bank if the voltage drops below a certain number normally about 24.3 volts uh, then at that point you would need to run the generator to charge the domestic battery pack and to um, avoid damaging the batteries um, Obviously, there are other batteries on board, but it's the domestic battery that you're taking the voltage for. We've then got boxes for generator, main engine. Are they running or are they not? And if you tick them for each hour they're running, then we'll get on to how that helps you later. Uh, check the day tank. So that there's a 100 litre fuel day tank in the engine room, which is what we pump fuel from the four fuel tanks on board into. Um, so it's important that we know how much fuel we are using so that we know how much fuel we have left uh, so if we know if we have the day tank marked normally on a scale of 0 to 10 and then uh, we when we refill the day tank and if we do that every hour when the engine or the generator has been running then when we refill the day tank we know how much extra fuel we've taken from our full bunker so if we know that we've got x liters of fuel and we know that we've used 15 liters then we can put that down there and over over a day we know how much fuel we've used so um when i was sailing we used to time filling the gray tank sorry filling the day tank with um either watch changes or um food times which is almost the same time 
so that we weren't bothering people that were sleeping because it's very noisy. Um, and if, you, um, if you're organized, then you can do that because you're not going to use an awful lot of fuel while you're sailing. Just a little bit for the generator. Okay, um, and then pump gray tank. So the vessel itself has gray tanks and black tanks. And um, depend on where you are, you may be pumping those gray tanks um, out into the sea. Uh, gray tanks are the water that's coming from um, your sinks and uh, from uh, wash hand basins, etc. So uh, it's gray water, not black water, not foul water. And um, that, that needs to be pumped fairly regularly because the tanks aren't very big. And if you don't pump them, they'll leak and they will smell. So it's important that the tanks are pumped regularly. And that would be something that you do every hour and something that the people in the galley would be doing on a regular basis. Um, then water maker. So is the water maker running? So that's important because we don't want to leave the water maker running all the time. The water maker runs and takes quite a lot of power. So it's important the generator is running at the same time that the water maker is running. And we also want to make sure we're not wasting uh, the power being provided by the generator by not making water when we have the opportunity to. Uh, we also need to know how much water we've made and how much water we're consuming because we've only got that amount of water with us. So if you're 1500 or 2000 miles from land, you need to know you have enough water for the 20 odd crew on board at any one time. So it's important that the water maker is managed properly. Then we've got bilges. So again, checking the bilges to make sure that um, the bilges aren't um, full or that the boat isn't taking on water. And if the boat, there will be water in the bilges, especially when it's rough. So it needs to be taken out of the bilges and put over the side. But it's also important to note the rate that you're taking on water because it's all well and good taking a little bit of water in. All boats take some water in. But if you're taking a lot of water in every hour, then you may have a bigger problem. Fix on the chart. So that's just a reminder that have you plotted a fix on the chart? Uh, now, it depends on every hour. You wouldn't well, I wouldn't plot a fix on the chart every hour on an ocean crossing, because if you did that on the chart scale that you use, you would end up, well, you just wouldn't be able to do it. So um, it wouldn't work. I found that the best way to do this was to plot a fix on the chart at the end of every watch. So um, if the oncoming watch leader or the offgoing watch leader plots a fix on the chart, uh, then it can also take part of, it can be part of the watch handover so that each watch leader knows what's happening and we've got an up-to-date position in the logbook. And then also any um, any changes in sale or sale plan or weather can also be looked at by both watch leaders at the time of handover. And then initials. So whoever's put this information into the log needs to initial it to take responsibility for that information. So it's important that you know what you're putting in here and you don't just blindly copy in stuff that you you think you know it is important and you must make sure that this information is correct and if you don't know you should ask okay so just looking then at the top of the page um, you have hours engine generator water maker so for each of those 24 lines you add up how many hours the engine has been running how many hours the generator has been running how many hours the water maker has been running and you put those totals into the page at the top so that gives us an indication uh, of whether we've been making enough water um, uh, it tells us whether or not we are having to run the generator for longer than normal to charge our batteries. Um, and it also shows um, how much fuel we are likely to have used. So we've also got reference to how much fuel we've pumped. So we know how much fuel we're using quite accurately. But on top of that, if we're running, the, uh, running this properly, then we also know how much fuel our generator is using. Uh, and we can work out how much fuel we've got left and whether it's enough. Okay, then um, fuel tanks. So as you can see top right, we've got fuel tanks. So there are four tanks on a on a Clipper 70. Uh, starboard outer, starboard inner, port outer, port inner. Uh, they are all, um, or they are different sizes. So some are bigger than others. And um, that is really just to give a, a, a quick look to see what is the approximate uh, situation with regard to fuel. So it's just in quarters. And so that needs to be done from time to time as you get to a point where you think, right, well, we've over the last few days, we've used X amount of litres of fuel and we're on 
this tank so I know we've used roughly 25% of that tank and you'd circle that to say that is 25% um, and so over time those tanks will obviously empty uh, until you've got no fuel in that tank so when you've got no fuel in the tank I would just put a straight line through the entire uh, 25 to 100 line to indicate that that tank is now empty and you would then obviously you would when you have an empty tank and it's no longer pumping to the day tank then you would change over the fuel to another fuel and it would be important that normally either only the engineer or the skipper or mate would do that so every skipper will have a different rule on that but it is important that with water and with fuel only specific people do this because otherwise it's too easy to um, think you've got more water than you've got or more fuel than you've got and suddenly realize oh no um, somebody changed the fuel or the water over three days ago and we haven't got that um, 500 liters that we thought we had so um, it is important that you look at that and um, and the only authorized people do it so that is the logbook hopefully that makes um, sense to you and it's pretty clear as you can see there is an additional additional notes section at the top of the page uh, so that's for specific things that you, perhaps perhaps you had um, I don't know an altercation with a couple of fishing vessels or um, there's a suspicious vessel that's been shadowing you or um, maybe maybe somebody has been uh, taken ill in which case you might make a note to refer to uh, the medical log um, that's as it says additional notes so additional information uh, so that is that hopefully that makes sense um, the log is kept every hour on the hour usually and um, it becomes a pretty religious thing that's done very effectively by crew won the race uh, it's important that you on, on training it's a little bit harder to do this because of course everybody is very busy doing lots of other stuff on the race itself there's always somebody available to go and do the log so um, the log gets maintained uh, very uh, efficiently so I hope that's uh, helped you and uh, do let me know if that's been of assistance and uh, if you'd like to like and share this video if it has been helpful to you that would be much appreciated thank you yeah.